dodo. Okay. Might be easier. Come on. If I turn off my TV, there we go. Okay. And we are back. Try some music on stream today. Okay, I can recap Sapiens, I think, before diving into War and Peace. Labor Day. And me with no plans to return to work tomorrow. Morning. At least not in a conventional sense. Talking about the white man's burden concept that European powers, imperialists improved colonies that they. that they took into their influence, put under their influence. Yuval explains that there's different different ways of seeing it, that they adversely affected their colonies, cultures, influencing them, they changed the way that those native peoples led their lives, how they were. And then there's of course the other line of thinking that those European powers positively changed those different areas that they colonized. And I think there's truth in both, both ways of thinking. Um, he also writes a little bit about um, the explorer and exploratory mindset that Britain had, particularly in exploring India, how they uncovered more about the Indus River Valley civilization and Indo-European root languages, I think Sanskrit and Old Persian being among them. They found out more about those like family of languages from From understanding and learning more about the culture there. Okay. And who knows, I might have a piano stream today after War and Peace. Let's see what I can remember from the songs that I used to play in my routine. Yeah, I have learned a lot, a lot of different songs. Hedwig's theme and when the saints go marching in, just to give a couple of examples. And yeah, I can see if I can remember how to play those again. I just need to take my piano out of the box, <laughs> and I've been reluctant to do so. I'm just uncertain about my own future. How long I'll stay here is not clear. Okay, but anyway, and as I often say, <laughs> piano, every single time I play it, I need to move 
my keyboard. Yeah, I've got to move it into and out of position because of the size of the 88 key piano. But on a brighter side and on a plus note, <laughs> I get like exercise physically lifting it, physically moving it. Okay. Alright, here we go, guys. Last time we left out on left off on chapter two and we had a chance to learn about a few different characters okay hold on it's initializing prince vasily i believe his name was and Princess Boltonskia. Anna Pavlovna, of course. She's older, but she's like the life of the party. Princess Boltonskia being physically attractive. Um, we're also introduced to Pierre, the big French dude. Um, all right, hold on a second. All right, yeah, up here. Uh, where were we? All right, here we are, chapter three. All right, and it's talking a little bit about Pierre, his own, his background. He studied at a foreign university. He's at this, like, social gathering he's trying to get the useful pieces of information uh, from the different people there all right let's continue let me angle my camera down a little bit okay there we go all right chapter three Anna Pavlovna's reception was in full swing. <laughs> the spindles hummed steadily and ceaselessly on all sides. With the exception of the aunt, beside whom sat only one elderly lady, who, with her thin, careworn face, was rather out of place in this brilliant society, the whole company had settled into three groups. One, chiefly masculine, had formed round the ab. Another of young people was grouped around the beautiful Princess Helene, Prince Vasily's daughter, and the little Princess Volkonskia, very pretty and rosy, though rather too plump for her age. The third group was gathered around Mortimar and Anna Pavlovna. The Vicomte was a nice looking young man with soft features and polished manners. who evidently considered himself a celebrity, but out of politeness, modestly placed himself at the disposal of the circle in which he found himself. Ugh, I got an itchy nose. Um, yeah, here's himself. Anna Pavlovna was obviously serving him up as a treat to her guests. As a clever maitre d', Hotel serves up as a specially choice delicacy, a piece of meat that no one who had seen it in the kitchen would have cared to eat. So Anna Pavlovna served up to her guests, first the Vicomte and then the Ab, as peculiarly choice morsels. The group about Mortimar immediately began discussing the murder of the Duc de Enghein. The Vicomte said at I said that the Duke de Enkheim had perished by his own magnanimity, and that there were particular reasons for Bonaparte's hatred of him. I wonder what they are. Ah, yes. Do tell us all about it, Vicomte, said Anna Pavlovna, with a pleasant feeling that there was something a la Louis XV in the sound of that sentence. 
Conte new seller of the Conte. The Conte. The Conte bowed and smiled creasily in token of his willingness to comply. Anna Pavlovna arranged a group around him, inviting everyone else to listen to his tale. The Conte knew the Duke personally, whispered Anna Pavlovna to other guests. I think there's a um, uh, typo here, because it just says two of the guests. So I think it, the word one has been omitted in this copy of the book. Yeah, it must have been omitted. Who knows? The Conti is a wonderful raconteur, said she to another. Some of these words I'm not familiar with. Raconteur. Let me look it up in the dictionary. Raconteur. Uh, it's pronounced recanter, I believe. It's a person who tells anecdotes in a skillful and amusing way. Some area of improvement that I can have. <laughs> amusing stories. Oops, I went ahead of page. Okay. How evidently he belongs to the best society, said she to a third. The Vicomte was served up to the company in the choicest and most advantageous style. Like a well-garnished joint of roast beef on a hot dish. Yeah, pretty good, pretty good comparison. The Vicomte wished to begin his story and gave a subtle smile. Come over here, Helene, dear said Anna Pavlovna to the beautiful young princess who was sitting some way off the center of another group. The princess smiled. She rose with the same unchanging smile with which she had first entered the room, the smile of a perfectly beautiful woman. And what a sight to see. <laughs> with a slight rustle of her white dress trimmed with moss and ivy, with a gleam of white shoulders, glossy hair, and sparkling diamonds. She passed between the men who made way for her, not looking at any of them but smiling on all, as if graciously allowing each the privilege of admiring her beautiful figure and shapely shoulders. It's like, look at me, look at me. Aren't I a sight to behold? Women like that sometimes remind me of like peacocks or something. They like showing their feathers. Okay. And I guess good looking men are that way too sometimes. I think it's just more common for women to have that going on. At least in this day and age. <laughs> woman with a, sli uh, with a slight rustle of her white dress trimmed with moss and ivy okay with a gleam of white shoulders glossy hair and sparkling diamonds she passed between the men who made way for her not looking at any of them but smiling on all as if graciously allowing each the privilege of admiring her beautiful figure and shapely shoulders back and bosom which in the fashion of those days was very much exposed she seemed to bring the glamour of a ballroom with her as she moved toward Anna Pavlovna. It's like they liked the chance to see her. Yeah, she was a sight to behold. Helene was so lovely that only did she not show any trace of coquetry, but on the contrary. Coquetry, it's a word I don't know. Coquetry is a flirtatious behavior or of a flirtatious manner. She's 
she was not being flirty. She, yeah, was just being maybe shy, yeah, reserved. Appeared shy of her unquestionable and all too victorious beauty. It's like, hey, I was born this way. <laughs> That's how she is. She seemed to wish, but to be unable to diminish its effect. I drink Mountain Dew Major Melon. Watermelon. I've always loved the taste of watermelon. Okay, where are we? How lovely, said everyone who saw her. And the Comte lifted his shoulders and dropped his eyes as startled by something extraordinary when she took her seat opposite and beamed upon him also with her unchanging smile. Madame, I doubt my ability before such an audience, said he, smiling, inclining his head. <laughs> it's like, I'm not worthy. <laughs> the princess rested her bare round arm on a little table and considered her reply unnecessary. It's like she didn't need to say anything at all. She smilingly waited. All the time the story was being told, she sat upright, glancing now at her beautiful round arm. Altered in shape by its pressure on the table, now at her still more beautiful bosom on which she readjusted the diamond necklace. It's like, she's amazing. <laughs> yeah, that's all you can say, she's amazing. From time to time, she smoothed the folds of her dress, and whenever the story produced an effect, she glanced at Anna Pavlovna, at once adopted just the expression she saw on the maid of honor's face, and again relapsed into her radiant smile. The little princess had also left the tea table and followed Helene. It's the daughter of Prince Prince V. Wait a moment. I'll get my work. Now then, what are you thinking of? She went on, turning to Prince Hippolyte. Fetch me my work bag. There was a general movement as the princess, smiling and talking merrily to everyone at once, sat down. sat down and gaily arranged herself in her seat. Now I'm all right, she said, and asking the Vicomte to begin, she took up her work. Prince Hippolyte, having brought the work bag, joined the circle and moving a chair close to her, seated himself beside her. But Charmant Hippolyte was surprising by his extraordinary resemblance to his beautiful sister. but yet more by the fact that in spite of this resemblance, he was exceedingly ugly. Mm -hmm. I need to think. Maybe they're like, they look similar, but Yeah, they look similar, but there's a few things that look off about how they look. Like gum. Yeah, there's like the few things that are different about the way they look. Makes him... It's like, yeah, it makes him seem extremely ugly, those few differences. Leo goes on to explain why that's the case. <laughs> his features are like his sister's. But while in her case everything was lit up by a joyous, self-satisfied, 
beautiful and constant smile of animation. And by the wonderful classic beauty of her figure, his face, on the contrary, was dulled by imbecility and a constant expression of sullen self-confidence, while his body was thin and weak. Um, alright, hold on a second. This is like a very oh hey Lord Fox thanks for watching it's like um, yeah it's an interesting use of words by Leo it's like sullen self-confidence like sullen is like it's like downtrodden in a way let me see if I can look it up in the dictionary yeah, downtrodden. It, it's like uh, bad-tempered and gloomy, like is how it's described here in the dictionary. A sullen pout. It's like, like that's how sullen is. It's like, like oh, this sucks. Everything sucks. <laughs> and it can also be used to describe, like, the weather, for example. The sky full of dark clouds, like a sullen, sunless sky. Like it was, it was all overcast. Which is not the case today. Today it's clear sky. Depressed mood. It could also mean. Um, yeah. What's strange is that. Yeah, it's saying his features were like his sister's, so they looked similar. Like Hippolyte and Helene look similar, but whereas she's vibrant, his face, on the contrary, he says, was dulled by imbecility and of sullen self-confidence, while his body is thin and weak. <laughs> kind of sad, in a way, Hippolyte. His character is definitely the sad contrast. But as I often say, it's like, um, yins need yangs, you know. If it were not the case, everyone would be the same. What would be the joy in that kind of world? There is a beauty in things that are unique. People that are unique. Um, okay. Yeah, it's like sullen self-confidence. It's like he was sad and confident at the same time. <laughs> it's like just a strange use of words. Yeah, self-confidence is trust in one's abilities. He just says like sullen self-confidence. It's like... I don't know. Hard for me to think of an example <laughs> of how to convey that. So and self confident. Yeah, I don't know. It's like he, he it's like he knows how much life sucks, I guess. Yeah, Ward Fox, hard to describe. I don't know, let me keep reading. Maybe it'll help me understand more about Hippolyte's character. Um, yeah, his eyes, nose, and mouth all seem puckered into a vacant, weary grimace. Like a Clint Eastwood type, like. <laughs> like I've had it choke down this pill called life a few too many times. And it just like so I fell into unnatural position. The 
the most natural position is probably like the way I'm sitting like with my legs like that maybe like that legs crossed maybe Leo just says unnatural positions here yeah I don't know you can try to imagine Turn on the light. Okay. Because I hate. Oh, oops, sorry, I skipped ahead. Okay, where was I? Okay. It's not going to be a ghost story. I said he's sitting down beside the princess and hastily adjusting his lorgnette. As if without this instrument, he cannot begin to speak. Lord Nyet. Uh, hold on a second. <laughs> I gotta look it up. A Lord Nyet is a pair of glasses or opera glasses held in front of a person's eyes by a long handle at one side. Is it one of those glasses you hold up in front of your face? I don't have it. I don't have one of your teas as an example. Maybe I can Google it. Yeah, let me try that. Oops. Spirit Fair. It's a game that centers on the theme of death. I'm seeing it mentioned a lot in the news and media. It's like, um, there's a story about a woman who was from Virginia. She went hiking in the, uh, Glacier, Glacier National Park, I think it's called. She didn't make it. Uh, she was 34 years old. Uh, but yeah, the reviews for Spirit Fair are pretty good, so I may consider getting it. And <laughs> I may play it on stream for you guys. But yeah, for the time being, my internet here is still not very fast. So it w we may have like uh, frame drops if I were to try it now. But the game looks really good, Spirit Fair. Uh, but anyway. Hold on a second. It looks... It looks like this. Yeah, th those are pretty old-fashioned. I would say. I actually used to wear glasses. Alright, hold on. I'm trying to set my camera up. There, I think that's fine. Yeah, I used to wear glasses for a long time. Um, I got like four or five pairs of glasses that I used to wear. Uh, from the time I think I was in the sixth grade, fifth or sixth grade, I had to wear glasses. I didn't have the ability to see far, far way away. It was like all blurry past like uh, foot in front of my face it was all blurry um, yeah and for a long time I had to wear glasses I have like four pairs of glasses that I still have left over from that time all those years of my life when I had to wear glasses and Eventually I got contacts. I think I got contacts of there, that's better. I think I got contacts 
uh, about the time that I was in high school. And yeah, I got used to contacts after a while. I needed to get used to actually putting my fingers in my eyes. I remember when I first got them that like I kept flinching because I had to like literally poke myself in the eyes to get those contacts on. Over time, I just got used to it. There were maybe a couple times where I got uh, torn contacts for one reason or another. Like there were a couple times where the contacts would just like fall out of my eyes. And yeah, over time, I tried something called LASIK Plus, which is basically eye surgery, laser eye surgery. I got it uh, a couple years ago, I think. And it, yeah, it worked extremely well. I've had 2020 vision ever since I got that laser eye surgery. And yeah, I would say if you can afford it, I would recommend it. I would say uh, yeah, border pocket <laughs> contacts. Contacts are good to have when you're like playing sports and stuff because I used to play like basketball and my glasses would fall off sometimes. Um, but yeah. The problem with contacts is that you need to be very diligent about cleaning them. Because if not, you can wind up with eye infections and stuff like that. Um, but, yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely a pain in the butt over time because you have to keep buying replacements, replacement contacts. A lot of it is based on my family history. Like my grandma was blind. Actually, both of my grandparents on my mother's side were blind. And yeah, I am of the belief that that had something to do with my nearsightedness. Yeah, both of them being blind. They both had retinitis, as a matter of fact. Um, but yeah. Good vision cannot be underestimated. Oh, but yeah, laser eye surgery. For me, it worked. I've had 2020 vision ever since that surgery. It took me like 24 hours to recover. At the time, I was like extremely freaked out because I didn't know what my results were going to be. It's like it takes like 24 hours for your eyes to heal. And and sure enough, my, my eyes actually did heal, but I was freaked out <laughs> at the time because I was like, oh gosh, are, are my eyes gonna, am I gonna be able to see after this surgery? And yeah, my eyes healed. I have like perfect vision now. It might be another 10 years or so before I actually need to, uh, before, I think it'll be at least 10 years before my vision deteriorates but yeah good vision is good to have um, yeah glasses yeah <laughs> I'm glad I don't have to use them at this point but yeah the lower yet were those like ones you can put in front of your face. I don't really know. Yeah, it says opera glasses. When I think of these type of glasses, that's what I think of. It's like you're in the opera, going to the opera or something like that. I don't know why.
seems kind of like a pain to like have to hold up your glasses like that. <laughs> it's like, oh yes. You can, you can wear them, it's like, oh yes, indeed. Seems kind of high society, I guess. I guess they had the same functionality as glasses. They would improve your ability to see. Glasses themselves work by refracting light. It like changes the way of light. Is how light transfers into the eye. Yeah, there's a, a lot of science behind just vision in general. Like basically our eyes, rods perceive light, the image is transferred and it's reflected on the back of our, uh, on the back of our retinas. Yeah, who knows, <laughs> maybe I can go back to be, go back to school to become an eye doctor. <laughs> Might be easier in a way than teaching. I guess to be an eye doctor, you need to talk to people about their eyes, so. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I can go back, who knows. Lorgnette. Okay, all right, <laughs> anyway, back to the story. <laughs> Uh, who's saying this? Uh, her Hippo Hippolyte saying it. Hippolyte is saying it's not going to be a ghost story. So he's sitting down beside the princess and hastily adjusting his lorgnette. As if without his instrument, he could not begin to speak. like oh yeah it's like a microphone in a way he, he's like i can't talk without my microphone all right board fox thank you for watching for sure thank you for visiting the stream he spoke with such oops skipped that again why no my dear fellow said the astonished narrator shrugging his shoulders because i hate ghost stories said Prince Hippolyte in a tone which showed that he only understood the meaning of the words after he'd uttered them. Yeah, I guess I'm that way sometimes. I pause to reflect often. He spoke with such self-confidence that his hearers could not be sure whether what he said was very witty or very stupid. He was dressed in a dark green dress coat. Knee breeches of the color of the nymph, Ephraim, as he called it, shoes and silk stockings. The Vicomte told his tale very neatly. Let me see if I can look up Vicomte. Vicomte is a French nobleman corresponding in rank to a Viscount. Viscounts, I think they're like earls. Um... Yeah, they're nobles. All right. Wouldn't it be nice for there to be no bourgeoisie, no rich? Wouldn't it be nice if the public good came first? Oh, but yeah, this count is a noble. The noble, um, it's below an earl and above a baron. Uh, is there a way to see the hierarchy? Actually, yeah, there is. I gotta go to the bathroom soon, guys. Sit tight. I'll be right back. Hold on. Yeah.
I'll, I'll break down the hierarchy a little bit when I return. I'm back. Okay, yeah, so their king is at the top. Alright, actually. The emperor is at the top. This is Imperial Royal. Um, sorry, there we go. The Imperial. <laughs> Imperial, royal, noble, gentry, and chivalric ranks in Europe. So there's the emperor on top, high king, great king, or queen. Then the king or queen is third in rank. Archduke is under that. Grand prince, grand duke, grand duchess. Then there's the prince under that. Dukes under that. Okay, yeah, duke is under prince. Uh, and then there's sovereign prince. Marquis. Um, counts. Counts and discounts. Uh, and then barons. Baronets. Knights, gentlemen's, gentlemen, sorry, and ministerialis. So all these are the ranks of nobility. Yeah, the, <laughs> the nobles. The Comtes, a French nobleman, so it's a French noble. Whew. A French noble corresponding in rank to a Viscount, which is the rank directly below Count. So it's less than a French Count. <laughs> The person who is speaking in this context is a French less than a count. <laughs> the Comte told his tale very neatly. It was an anecdote, then current, to the effect that the Duc de Ankine had gone secretly to Paris to visit Mademoiselle George. That at her house he came upon Bonaparte, who also enjoyed the famous actress's favors, and that in his presence Napoleon happened to fall into one of the fainting fits to which he was subject, and was thus at the Duke's mercy. The latter spared him, and this magnanimity Bonaparte subsequently repaid by death. Uh, magnanimity, I think, is generousness. Yeah. The, yeah. the condition of being generous. No, it's like he did something nice and then he kills him in return. Yeah, 
thank you, Lord Fox, for the chat. Gotta fix my shirt. Okay, here we go. The story was pretty in Yeah, sorry. The story was very pretty and interesting, especially at the point where the rivals suddenly recognized one another. And the ladies looked agitated. Charming, said Anna Pavlovna with an inquiring glance at the little princess. Charming, or you should say a Volkswagen. Charming, whispered the little princess, sticking the needle into her work, as if to testify that the interest and fascination of the story prevented her from going on with it. The Vicomte appreciated the silent praise and smilingly smiling gratefully prepared to continue but just then Anna Pavlovna who had kept a watchful eye on the young man who so alarmed her noticed that he was talking too loudly and vehemently with the ab so she hurried to the rescue Pierre had managed to start a conversation with the ab about the balance of power and the latter evidently interested by the young man's simple-minded eager eagerness was explaining his pet theory Sounds interesting, the pet theory. Both were talking and listening too eagerly and too naturally, which is why Anna Pavlovna disapproved. Too naturally and too eagerly. The combination of the two. The means are the balance of power in Europe and the rights of the people. The ab was saying. Uh, what is ab? Abs are in France again an abbot or other cleric. Yeah, there you go. Power of the church. It is only necessary for one powerful nation like Russia, barbaric as she is said to be, to place herself disinterestedly at the head of an alliance, having for its object the maintenance of the balance of power of Europe. And it would save the world. Yeah, I think the balance of power is important. They say absolute power corrupts absolutely. I think is the expression. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. Attributed to Lord Acton. Power tends to corrupt. So, yeah. I'd say I agree. I agree with Anna here. But how are you to get that balance? Pierre was beginning. At that moment, Anna Pavlovna came up and, looking severely at Pierre, asked the Italian how he stood Russian climate. I am to believe that it is quite cold there. Although I've never been. Russia seems cool. Foreign and cool. Betrov... Uh, what is it? Betrov... Betrovnia... Petrovia. Petrovnia. Yeah. <laughs> okay. How are you getting along with the weather? The Italian's face instantly changed and assumed an offensively affected, sugary expression, evidently habitual to him when conversing with women. It's like if, yeah, the way he has when he talks to people. Girls and women, I guess. Um, <laughs> sugary expression. Yeah. Sugary expression of the Italian. Of course. <laughs> I'm so enchanted by the brilliancy of the wit and the culture of the society. 
more especially of the feminine society in which I have had the honor of being received. But I have not yet had the time to think of the climate, said he. Uh, it's like he had their love to keep him warm, I guess. I've got my love to keep me warm. Not letting the Abbe and Pierre escape, Anna Pavlovna, the more conveniently to keep them under observation, brought them into the large circle, larger circle. Chapter 4 is quite long. Yeah, Chapter 4 is pretty long. Um, I think I'll continue, guys. Chapter 4, and if I get tired of reading, I can switch gears. Switch gears and try, try piano. Again, I have to see what I can remember. All right, let me get a refill before I do. Yeah, yeah. let me get a refill and I'll be right back. As I always say, thank you for watching. And thank you for joining me. Okay, I'll be right back. Gravity. back I'll try to pick up my speed a little bit with which I read so I can get through a little bit faster just then another visitor entered the drawing room Prince Andrew Bolkonski the little princess's husband he was a very handsome young man of medium height with firm clear-cut features everything about him from his weary bored expression to his quiet measured step offered a most striking contrast to his quiet little wife Again, uh, there, I can see myself a little better. One thing I like that Leo, Leo Toys, Tolstoy is doing is he's setting up like contrasts between characters. Again, it's the uniqueness that's special and unique. <laughs> the uniqueness that's remarkable. And yes, unique. Uh, Mountain Dew Frostbite. <laughs> okay. And no, I'm not sponsored, but it would be nice, Pepsi. It would be nice. Okay. <laughs> All right, yeah, it's a contrast to his wife. It was evident that he not only knew everyone in the drawing room, but had found them to be so tiresome that it wearied him to look at or listen to them. I get this way a lot too. It's like uh, sometimes social, like I can only take so much social. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's like then you'll know when, you'll know when the time has come because I'll up and vanish from the party. <laughs> Storm or go. And among all these faces that he found so tedious, none seemed to bore him so much as that of his pretty wife. Aww. 
love thy wife. They married her. He turned away from her with a grimace that distorted his handsome face, kissed Anna Pavlovna's hand, and screwing up his eyes, scanned the whole company. You're off to the war, prince, said Anna Pavlovna. General Kut Kutuzov, said Volkonsky, speaking French and stressing the last syllable of the general's name like a Frenchman, has been pleased to take me as an aide de camp. And Lise, your wife, she will go to the country. Are, <laughs> are you not ashamed to deprive us of your charming wife? Andre said his wife, addressing her husband in the same coquettish manner in which she spoke to other men. The Comte has been telling us such a tale about Mademoiselle George and Bonaparte. Prince Andy screwed up his eyes and turned away. Pierre, who from the moment Prince Andrew entered the room had watched him with glad affectionate eyes, now came up and took his arm. Before he looked around, Prince Andrew frowned again, expressing his annoyance with whoever was touching damn bugs. Screwed his eye, screwed up his eyes. <laughs> he screwed up his eyes with that Red Rider BB gun. <laughs> I think this is before the time of uh, what is it, Christmas story? Just shoot your eye out. <laughs> Took his arm. Before he looked around, Prince Andrew frowned again. Expressing his annoyance with whoever was touching his arm. He's like, let go of me. <laughs> but when he saw Pierre's beaming face, he gave him an unexpectedly unexpectedly kind and pleasant smile. There now. So you two are in the great world? Said he to Pierre. Yeah, he's seen the sights. I knew you'd be here, replied Pierre. I will come to supper with you. May I? Excuse me. May I? He added in a little voice so as not to disturb the Comte who was continuing his story. No, impossible, said Prince Andrew, laughing and pressing Pierre's hand to show that there was no need to ask the question. He wished to say something more, but at that moment Prince Vasily and his daughter got up to go, and two young men rose to let them pass. It's like, you don't even need to ask, just show up. <laughs> you must excuse me, <clears throat> you must excuse me, dear Vicomte, Vicomte, said Prince Vasily to the Frenchman, holding him down by the sleeve in a friendly way to prevent his rising. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Try to prevent him from doing anything in as a friendly way as possible. <laughs> it was like, in a friendly way, he prevented him from getting up and going. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe he thought it was for his benefit or something. This unfortunate feat of the ambassadors deprives me of a pleasure and obliges me to interrupt you. I am very sorry to leave your enchanting party, said he, turning to Anna Pavlovna. His daughter, Princess Helene, passed between the chairs, lightly holding up the folds of her dress, and the smile shone still more radiantly on her beautiful face. Pierre gazed at her with rapturous, almost frightened eyes as she passed him. Ah, Princess Helene. Very lovely, said Prince Andrew. Very, said Pierre. In passing, Prince Vasily seized Pierre's hand and said to Anna Pavlovna, Educate this bear for me. He's been staying with me a whole month, and this is the first time I've seen him in society. Nothing is so necessary for a young man as a society of clever women. And it helps. It always helps to have female company. They help keep guys like me on the straight and narrow. <laughs> Anna 
and a pit bull and a smile and promised to take Pierre in hand. She knew his father to be a connection of Prince Vasilis. <laughs> the elderly lady who had been sitting with the old aunt rose hurriedly and overtook Prince Vasily in the ante room. Ante room? An ante room is the ante chamber, typically serving as a waiting room. Yeah. Patiently waiting in my waiting room. All the affectation of interest she had assumed had left her kindly and tear worn face, and it now expressed only anxiety and fear. How about my son Boris, Prince? said she, hurrying after him into the anteroom. I can't remain any longer in Petersburg. Tell me what news I may take back to my poor boy. Although Prince Vasily listened reluctantly and not very politely to the elderly lady, even betraying some impatience, she gave him an ingratiating and appealing smile. And took his hand that he might not go away. What would it cost you to say a word to the emperor, and then he would be transferred to the guards at once, said she. Uh, yeah, transferred to the guards. Believe me, princess, I'm ready to do all I can, answered Prince Vasily. But it's difficult for me to ask the emperor. I should advise you to appeal to Ramyantsev through Prince Golitsyn. Yeah, sorry, you guys. I'll try my best with the Russian. Golenstein. <laughs> That would be the best way. The elderly, the elderly lady was a Princess Drubetskaya, belonging to one of the best families in Russia, but she was poor, and having long been out of society and had lost her influential connections. She had now come to Petersburg to procure an appointment in the guards for her only son. It was, in fact, solely to meet Prince Vasily that she had obtained an invitation to Anna Pavlovna's reception and had sat listening to the Vicomte's story. Prince Vasily's words frightened her and embittered look clouded her once handsome face. But only for a moment. Then she smiled again and clutched Prince Vasily's arm more tightly. Listen to me, Prince, said she. I have never yet asked you for anything and I will never again, nor have I ever reminded you of my father's friendship for you. But now I entreat you to God's entreat you for God's sake to do this for my son. And I shall always regard you as a benefactor. She added hurriedly, No, don't be angry, but promise. I've asked old Steen, and he has refused. Be the kind hearted man you always were, she said, trying to smile through tears uh, trying to smile though tears were in her eyes. Papa, we shall, uh, we shall be late," said Princess Helene, turning her beautiful head and looking over her classically molded shoulder as she stood waiting by the door. Influence in society, however, is a capital which has to be economized if it's to last. Yeah, it's like use the power of influence. Prince Vasily knew this, and having once realized that if he had asked on, about, on behalf of all who begged of him, he would soon he, he would soon be able, unable to ask for himself. He became chary of using his influence. I might be saying chary incorrectly. It's C H A R Y. No, yeah, it is pronounced chary. It's cautiously or suspiciously reluctant to do something. Um, yeah, I don't know why he's reluctant to use it. Um, if 
he asked on behalf of all who begged of him, he was going to be unable to ask for himself. Maybe there's a limit to how much influence he can use. Prince Vasily. Like, there's only so many favors he can call in. <laughs> there's only so many lifelines he can use before he's all out of questions to answer. <laughs> before he's all out of um, ways to get the question right. Who wants to be a millionaire? It's like if you get the question wrong, you, you can't keep going on. I think it's kind of like, kind of like that. <laughs> but in Princess Grubetskia's case, he felt after her second appeal something like qualms of conscience. She had reminded him of what was quite true. He had been indebted to her father for the first steps in his career. Moreover, he could see by her manner that she was one of those women, mostly mothers, who, having once made up their minds, excuse me, will not rest until they have gained their end, and are prepared, if necessary, to go on insisting day after day, hour after hour, and even to make scenes. This last consideration moved him. <laughs> it's like he's like. He's like, I'll do it. Just, just please don't, please don't cause a scene. Please don't draw any attention to yourself. Go, go, fiend! <laughs> you brute! <laughs> My dear Anna. Mikhailovna said he with his usual familiarity and with weariness of tone. It is almost impossible for me to do what you ask, but to prove my devotion to you and how I respect your father's memory, I will do the impossible. Your son shall be transferred to the guards. Hooray, she says. Here is my hand on it. Are you satisfied? My dear benefactor, this is what I expected from you. I knew your kindness. He turned to go. So, Anne is getting what she wants. Wait, just a word. When he has been transferred to the guards, she faltered. You're on good terms with Michael Leorinovich Kujizov. Recommend Boris to him as adjutant. Then I shall be at rest, then. Uh, an adjutant... 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 It's a military officer who acts as an administrative assistant to a senior officer. Like a deputy. Then I shall be at rest then. I guess maybe that's a higher position than he was being originally recommended for, I'm thinking. Uh, Prince Vasily smiled. No, I won't promise that. You don't know how Kudazov is pestered since his appointment as commander in chief. He told me himself that all the Moscow ladies have conspired to give him all their sons as adjutants. No, but do promise I won't let you go, my dear benefactor. Papa said his beautiful daughter in the same tone as before. He shall be late. Well, au revoir. Goodbye. You hear? You hear her? Then tomorrow you'll speak to the emperor? Certainly, but about Kudazov, I don't promise. I don't make any promises I can't keep. And I'm not promising you this time. It's not 
I promise. So don't pin all your hopes and dreams on it. I do promise. I do promise Vasily cried Anna and fell Kale Kailovna as he went. With the smile of a coquettish girl, which at one time probably came naturally to her, but was now very ill suited to her careworn face. Apparently she had forgotten her age and by force of habit employed all the old feminine arts. Ah yes, they are quite crafty. Yeah. Watch out. <laughs> That's all I gotta say, watch out. Okay. Uh, apparently she had forgotten her age and by force of habit employed those arts. The dark arts. <laughs> but as soon as the prince had gone, her face resumed its former cold, artificial expression. She's like, okay, I can go back to not having to impress anybody now. I don't need to impress him now that he's gone. I can let it all hang out. She returned to the group where the Vicomte was still talking and again pretended to listen while waiting until it would be time to leave. Her task was accomplished. So we already know that Anna's... She's good at manipulating for political purpose and gain. Yeah, Anna Ernest. And yeah, she's good at getting what she wants. Okay, next time, chapter five, we will dive into. Okay. All right, I'm going to transition to music. I'll see what I can remember, guys. I don't think I'll be able to take any requests. I hope you've been enjoying this series, the War and Peace series. Um, yeah, I don't think that I'll be able to take any requests. I'll just shoot to see what I can remember from my routine. Stand by, guys. <laughs> 